Your local palace of entertainment. The flicks, the pictures, the flea pit. Whatever you knew it as, it was part of everyday life. For 40 years, the cinema was a major source of entertainment in Britain. The heyday of cinema was during the 1940s. In 1946 alone, there were 1,635 million attendances. It was an institution which seemed unchallengeable until the advent of television. Now, sadly, our cinemas are going out of business. In this age of screens one to five and two pounds fifty for one film, it was a pleasure to join Clyde Jevons of the British Film Institute in a traditional cinema. You can't beat the magic of walking through that curtain into the darkened auditorium with the flickering silver light and the prospect of an evening's entertainment before you. The news, the cartoon, trailers, the B film, and the feature. But there was another element of the evening that we mustn't forget and which Clyde has collected, the cinema advert. And a fascinating collection it is too. I had no idea just how far back they go. This one was filmed at the turn of the century for Vinolia soap. It had to be shot outside the factory gates to get enough light. And the camera doesn't move, so the people do. It's one of the oldest in the collection. It may look simple now, but it was an innovation in its day. They began uh, in the very early days, elaborately long. Uh, and some of the very early, um, what we call them advertising films, they're more like documentaries. They were elaborate descriptions of the Cabri's factory, for example, or Peak Free and Biscuit factory. And uh, look, look with hi looking back with hindsight, they're quite um, important films because they do show you a um, great deal yeah. of what was going on. And it's only uh, when you reach the 40s, World War II, when film stock becomes very expensive and limited, that uh, there is a drastic reduction in the length of the commercials. Trying to make their impact in less time and less footage. Well, that's what, that's what, that's what arose. Um, the filmmaker had to learn to do that because he simply couldn't use as much uh, film stock as he used to. The Wills Woodbine commercial, I mean, uh, I think you couldn't really call a documentary or a soft sell. Um, it's a full-scale pantomime. Well, it's a pretty appalling parody of, of kind of the musical uh, comedy films that were made at the time. But that, again, that has very high production value. It was, it was made by um, the Alexander Corder studio, um, which made very important feature films. <laughs> Never saw since. One thing to note in it is, of course, it had a star, Edward Chapman, the well known character mm. actor of the time. And it's one of the rare occasions when somebody is actually credited as being in a commercial. A Turkish sheik arrived and proposed marriage to the whole chorus. What? All of them at once? The girls seemed to think he was Douglas Fairbanks and Rudolph Valentino, all rolled into one. But the girls are finding out it's no great shakes in the harem. Not many left. Dingy old beast. He gives us fewer and fewer each week. They're my only consolation. I don't mind telling you I'm bored. <clears throat> I come to the conclusion my wife's smoked too much. Not seemly my wife smoke the WD and HO Will cigarette. Our heroes have reached Istanbul. Hey, lad, I, I'm right weary. I got fat, flat feet, the nose. Come on, let's sit down for a bit. It's no good, I'll never find her. Hey. That tune. That's right. I hope you get that going. Betty. Betty. Blimey. What happens in my wife's bedroom? The um the classic curly cut uh, 
advert for tobacco, which I'm sure wouldn't be allowed today. It's quite outrageous in its use of the, the medical profession, isn't it? I will not have that noise in my house. What is the matter with you? You're like a bear with a sore head lately. Oh, and who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? First it's the barrel organ outside, then it's the kid underneath, and now it's that gramophone. Everybody tries to annoy me. Poor thing. And what about me? Shouldn't I be annoyed? And what have you to be annoyed about? Oh, nothing. Only if I suggest that we go out anywhere, you just can't be bothered. You mope and sit around and expect everybody else to be as miserable as you are. Now stop, stop, stop. I will not have arguments. They irritate me. And you irritate me. I'm going straight home to my mother and serve you right. And serve her right, you mean? And if I were you, I should go and see a doctor. Perhaps he can cheer you up. A doctor? That's not a bad idea. Your prescription. To be taken as often as possible between meals. Ah, bless the child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your medicine certainly has done you good, even though you've only been taking it for three weeks. Yes, and you know it's the best medicine I've ever taken? Mm, certainly smells nice. And it tastes nice. I say, my darling, put on the gramophone. Well, it appears appalling now by uh, modern standards of uh, regulations of what's acceptable and what would govern health warnings and so on. I'm actually having a doctor advise uh, somebody to smoke for their nerves. But I, I think I recall this myself when I was young, that... Uh, um, if one had nerves, but, um, one, doctors would advise smoking. I, mm. I think I can remember that. Well, in all forms of advertising at that time, claims could be made, which I think people wouldn't allow today. Yes, I think it's only uh, with the coming of television that um, more stringent standards have, uh, have been imposed, uh, simply because uh, things are reaching a much wider public in a more influential way. And There's that sort of quasi-scientific approach to the advertising and the, the wild fantasy of wills. <clears throat> also in two more, there's a much more modern sort of approach to the selling of the product, isn't there? It is very modern and, and sort of rather laid back. It's in, the, it's in that rather nice uh, sort of English realist style um, of a middle-class domestic setting and uh, not overactive at all and rather intriguing in, in its social setting and the, and the location shots. intrigued by um, uh, this guy selling cigarettes on the beach. I don't think I ever remember that happening. I wonder if that really happened. But it's also very modern, this, this comparison between the, the kind of the silly family who can never get it right and, uh, and the good family who've got it absolutely together to the extent they can afford a five pound holiday. Improved their lifestyles enormously. Yes, I mean, they're not going to live to see 40, <laughs> but, uh, the way they're smoking in the film. But, uh, they're having a good time. This was the peak time, I think, for um, the use of film in, in advertising in the cinema, uh, dressing them up as entertainment films. It was the kind of heyday, the advertising film. And Ford, in particular, had virtually a whole film industry of its own going. It made numerous um, short, medium-length, quite long uh, magazine-style films full of uh, uh, matter not necessarily related to the Ford company, just to keep the audience entertained, and every so often there would be a the mention of a Ford product or something. The road, the sun's in the sky, a heaven of blue, the world dashes by. You feel so happy when you're sweeping along. A leafy by way, thinking a song to the rhythm of the road. And um, again, the production values were particularly high on this in the sense that the, the song and the orchestra were specially commissioned for the film. They actually set up a King Palmer's Shadow V8 Orchestra, I think it was called. Um, for the purposes of this uh, particular film and employed Gordon Little, who was a sort of popular band singer, to, to sing the song. And the song itself was launched at the Ford Motor Show of that year in 1936 at, at uh, the Albert Hall, I think. So it was a, quite a big number. And it's a pure entertainment in the sense that uh, it's inviting the audience to sing along, uh, which was a very popular thing to do in the cinema then. The sun's in the sky, a heaven of blue, the world dashes by. Uh, the 
the old Trojan commercial is much simpler, isn't it? Well, it's more prosaic at the, the approach at that stage. It's about the mid-twenties when I think that car was manufactured. And uh, although already the commercials were giving a, a quite a complex narrative approach, more or less subtle, with the payoff um, either some part way through at the end of the film, this is much more a direct approach mm -hmm. to selling the car. But even then, uh, it, it has some subtleties of its own. The, uh, the economics at the beginning, uh, comparing your foot, proving wearing out of your footwear with it's actually uh, cheaper than a pair of yes, boots. Exactly, yes. <laughs> or, or, or four shilling socks. Or something. Um, so it, it still has a, a soft approach as well. demonstrating the, uh, the thing itself is very much of the time. There was a, uh, and the advertising very much um, harped on the, the product itself and how it worked and how, how well made it was. And, uh, and demonstrating it on film like that was, was very much the, the approach of that time. It was a very extraordinary motor car, of course. Yes. I, I believe it was quite popular. I think it was an attempt uh, at a sort of British uh, Model T, um, a popular car uh, for the lower middle classes or something of that nature. It does look quite impressive on the film, actually. <laughs> you still do some pretty weird things. Yes. I can't think of many cars today that could, uh, could do that. Humour features in a lot of commercials nowadays, and obviously in some of these old ones as well. When did the advertisers reckon that, that they realised that that was a, a good selling point? Well, right at the beginning, really. Um, a couple of examples we've got and, we'll, and are showing um, uh, the Dewar, early Dewar's whiskey commercials from the late 1890s, um, believed, shot, I believe, by Edison in, in the United States. Um, one of those is, a, is a quite a humorous vignette of uh, pictures coming to life and showing the Scotsman's um, glass of whiskey before Queen Victoria pops down and in portrait form and joins the fray. I mean, that's, I'm, that is meant to be humorous, obviously. Yes. And, uh, and humor has often been uh, the most popular and most successful form of advertising. I, I think a recent survey um, demonstrated that that's still true, that ads like um, the Joan Collins in Zano and Heineken and uh, the John Cleese commercials are the most successful in terms of market research. And so humour has always been a very strong vein running right through all the commercials. The uh, elopement in France is uh, terrific. I mean, you could put that out today, couldn't you? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Perfect uh, comic vignette. Uh, very much in a modern style. And made um, by a man called Richard Massingham, who made many of the um, Ministry of Information shorts, instructional shorts during World War II, which were themselves made intentionally humorously. Yes. Massingham was a very eccentric uh, sort of filmmaker and with a, with a weird sense of humor and appeared often in his own Film. So those kind of uh, filling up, don't put too much water in the bath, how to make a cup of tea, those kind of things. So, um, for, so for him, making commercials like this was a natural offshoot of, um, of that, that kind of filmmaking. But he was also capable of, of um, lyrical approach as well. He was very adaptable. And um, commercial made, he made just after the war, um, An Englishman's Home which is quite a very lyrical indeed, and, and quite clearly an attempt to re-establish 
in true English values after the, after the conflict. Let's get back to good middle-class living again. Home again, free. Free to get out of these things and into something comfortable. Free to enjoy this. and, uh, and our, our Staffordshire China, the simple yes. things of life. <laughs> and, uh, but that is, that is a very soft, subtle approach, which again uh, would stand up now, I think, um, uh, as a kind of a nostalgia. Mm. You could use, actually, the, the period. It's well, very, it's very uh, in fact, Ovaltine trendy thing to do now. Done exactly. that. Yeah, of course, that kind of uh, lifestyle was very rapidly swept away with the coming in of the social, socialist government mm. and so on. Um, within a decade, I doubt if many people uh, were actually living like that. Um, although at the time, that would have been uh, that w the assumption would have been that that is what you aspire to. That uh, very cosy, gentle lifestyle, twin beds and a cup of Horlicks instead of the other. You know? <laughs> Another point in those, uh, um, in both the, the Swan film and in Englishman's Home, the use of. Uh, devices like uh, children and animals, um, very obviously so in Swan Pants, the big uh, doughy-eyed close-up of the little girl and baby, uh, her baby talk. Um, less obviously so in Englishman's Home, which is uh, camera simply cuts to the kitten and the dog romping on the, on the carpet. Um, but these, these devices, again, start right at the beginning of uh, commercials. Uh, the filmmakers soon cotton on to uh, things that may make the audience go, ah. Oh, the commercials obviously are interesting for us now to look at because of the picture of life that they give. Are any commercials actually worth preserving for artistic reasons? Very much so. Um, I, particularly, I think, um, in this country, which, which has, a, for some reason, an extremely strong traditional link between the legitimate filmmaker and the commercial. And the commercial is certainly not uh, something to be thrown away and, and, and snubbed simply because it's advertising something. And um, the George Powell uh, series of commercials for Horlicks, which were, uh, again, quite elaborate puppet animation. George Powell was a very fine animator at the start of his career. Uh, made a whole series of uh, quite high budget, um, technicolor animation films advertising Horlicks. And, but they were, again, to go back to a point we made earlier, they're entertainment films, of course. That it, it is cartoon length. It's, it's the length you would expect a cartoon to be, whether it was Mickey Mouse or, or George Pell's Horlicks. And uh, made to a very high standard and, and to a very high budget. Take him away. has been found for the airman's lethargy. And you've guessed it, Horlicks. Largely through the GPO film unit, which grew up in the 30s, which uh, accommodated all the experimental documentary filmmakers like Humphrey Jennings and Cabell Canty, um, and Len Lai and people like that, um, did extraordinary experimental work through commercials. So, for example, uh, Rainbow Dance, which is probably Len Lai's supreme um, piece of anima animation filmmaking, um, is that, it's just advertising the post office savings bank. That's, that's the payoff. But it's a remarkable um, experimental animation film in its own right, and often quoted in people's 10 best lists as, as, as being a work of genius. Save.
savings bank, puts a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for you. The next phase, I suppose, of the commercial was the coming of television, wasn't it? Now, has that changed the, the, the nature of these short commercials or not? Not a lot. You see, the film commercial, the cinema commercial, was already uh, reducing to something approaching a television length. Uh, the, I think the most popular ones were about a minute or two minutes in the cinema. Um, and the first television commercials, although they varied greatly in length, uh, tend to be slightly longer than, um, than they are now. And, uh, and there was a crossover as well. You could use, um, they were made on film. And so they could be shown on television or, or in the cinema. And indeed, the first ones were, including what is allegedly the very first uh, television commercial for Gibbs SR toothpaste. It's tingling fresh. It's fresh as ice. It's Gibbs SR toothpaste, the tingling fresh toothpaste that does your gums good too. The tingle you get when you brush with SR is much more than a nice taste. It's a tingle of health. It tells you something very important, that you're doing your gums good and toughening them to resist infection. And as this chart shows, gum infection is the cause of more tooth losses than decay itself. The tingle in SR comes from sodium ricinoleate, a substance which both dental research and years of use in dental practice have shown to be good for the gums. So, to keep your teeth white as snow, your gums really healthy, and your breath really fresh, see your dentist regularly and brush with SR, the tingling fresh toothpaste for teeth and gums. Gibbs SR. Its technique is not much different um, from many commercials today, 30 years later, is still that kind of a spurious bit with the graph, you know, proving, proving something by a graph. And, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the copy um, that's written for the product is, is very similar to the things you hear today. What happens to your collection most of the time? Is it uh, accessible? It is, uh, theoretically, the whole collection is or should be accessible. There's obviously no point in preserving uh, masses and masses of films and television programs if uh, they cannot both be enjoyed again and studied um, in the future. Um, it is, however, a problem of priority and funding. Um, if we have a difficult enough time simply preserving <laughs> uh, neglected yeah. films and television programs. Um, but progressively, we try to uh, make duplicate copies of everything so that they can at least be studied by serious researchers and students and also we put back on the screen um, but we can do this in a variety of ways we're doing it today via a television program and we also try and put on programs of, of particularly our rarer material and the advertising collection is a good example um, in as it were uh, our own cinemas like the national film theater and regional film theaters and uh, venues of that nature and in adverts, the magic always works. Daddy gets his new swan pen and becomes a successful novelist. Our smoking friend realises that by smoking a new brand, he can have a holiday next year, and he's gained a pal. And of course, in your new Trojan, you can avoid untimely death at level crossings. Meanwhile, back at the harem... I certainly take me hat off to that old Turk. <laughs> He's taught you girls a thing or two. I only hope missus will come to like it. <laughs> oh, it's the there's any gas of fun in sinking low. Take matches and your wood vines. There's then a walking go.
At the same time next week, a sense of the past looks back to life in Britain's industrial communities in the north. Well, later tonight, we've got That's Hollywood. My name's Friday. It was 6 a.m. when she showed, carrying a one-day bus pass. But how come she was using it this early? All day, she gave me the runaround. And then later, much later, big trouble. My change had expired, but her 60p bus pass hadn't. I should have guessed. You can now use an outer zone one-day bus pass any day, any time. Memo. Get one at the newsagents. <laughs> when they're open. Now visit America with TWA and see a lot of it with our US Rover ticket, giving TWA flights in America for only £22 each. Hmm? Four flights minimum, up to eight, anywhere on TWA's network. Visit Hollywood on the stars, the Grand Canyon, Florida Everglades. Even your friends in Dallas. Oh, the America you dreamed about. 22 quid a flight. Making the way to the USA. TWA. Oh. Feeling any easier, Ron? Yeah, great. But you can't ease my head as well. Blocked up no then. Right. And a sore throat. Well, I can ease that for you, my son, with uh, Hall's Memphalyptus. You see, Hall's has this uh, special vapor action that penetrates right through your cold, to soothe your throat and unblock your nose. I'll try it on the ref. Maybe it could unblock his eyesight. <laughs> Hall's Memphalyptus, vapor action for your nose and throat, now new herbal flavor. At 12 o'clock tonight, the sea movies are featured, and that's Hollywood. But now, I'd better get my skits on. <laughs>